Nice, okay. Uh, hey guys, so welcome to our lecture on segment trees. Um, so basically the goal of segment trees is you have some array A of size N of some value type. And you wanna be able to do two things in log N. You wanna be able to update any of the values in A. Um, and you also wanna be able to do like some kind of range query. Like you could do like a range sum or a range maximum or something like that uh, for any arbitrary like sub range of A in log N. Um, so sort of a more concrete example would be like, let's say you have A is an array of N integers and you wanna do these two kinds of queries. So one is increase AI by some value K and the other is to return the sum of the elements from AI to AJ inclusive. And again, we want both of these to be done in log n time. Um, so any questions about how this works? So there are a ways of other ways of doing this um, if you don't have to do updates. Like for example, for the sum queries, you could just do a prefix sum, um, but it gets a lot more complicated and you have to use a segment tree if you're doing the updates. All right. So basically the idea of a segment tree is it's a binary tree where every node uh, represents the sum of elements in a given range. Um, and so sort of your root is the whole array. And then from there, you sort of recursively keep splitting it in half until um, every node represents like a single element. And so uh, sort of as a way to visualize it. Yeah. So let's say this was your original array, um, two, four, six, one, three, five, two. Um, so your root node is um, everything. So that's the whole array. And that stores the sum of everything in the array, right? Because if you add these up, uh, you get 23. And then what we keep doing is we keep sort of splitting it in half. So we send like zero to three over here and then four to six over here. Um, and again, we have like the sum of these four elements here. Uh, which is 13. And you keep breaking it down until you get down to um, just single elements. And if you look here, you get two, four, six, one, three, five, two, which is our original array here. Um, and if you think about how you can construct this, you can sort of do it recursively, where like if you have a function um, like f of lr, right, um, you can find out, you can split it in half find out what the values of the children are, and then just add them up, right? And then the one edge case you have to deal with is if you're a single node, then you just return the value at that position of the array. And one nice thing to notice about this is that you have at most two end nodes. Um, so this is gonna be linear in terms of space complexity. So does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so then if we wanna do a query on this for like um, some arbitrary range, um, it turns out you can always split it up into log n distinct ranges, distinct and disjoint ranges. So for example, if you wanna do a query on the range one to four, we can break it up like this, um, where you have like one by itself and then two and three together and then four. And it turns out no matter what range you do, you can always split it up into these like O of log N distinct ranges. And then the question becomes, how do we like find uh, where these ranges are given the query? Oh yeah, so, so first of all, um, how we implement this is uh, we're actually gonna store this as an array um, where each index represents a node and then the value at that point is just this value here. Um, so we're gonna root it at index one because uh, then what we can do is uh, make the left child of every node two i and the right child two i plus one. Um, so uh, if I you root it, sorry. Yeah. I don't know if you, any of you guys have like taken data structures to construct a heap or a priority queue. It's the exact yeah. same idea as that. We just like, instead of making the tree an explicit tree, you like sort of implicitly make it a tree by storing the actual values in it, right? Right. Um, and you can't root it at zero, right? Because then the left child of zero would be zero and the right child would be one. So you have like, it, it's a child of itself. So that doesn't work, which is why you have to root it at one. And so one kind of slight problem with this is 
you're not going to use every single node. Um, so even though we only have up to two n nodes, this can take up to four n memory, uh, which is most of the time fine because we don't really care about constant factors much, but it can matter in some cases. Okay, yeah, so like in, for example, here, this would be index one, then index two, and like index four, index five. Uh, yeah, someone had a question? Wait, so, okay, never mind, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so th this makes sense, like how we do the indexing. Like Keith said, it is like sort of the standard trick that you use for like a heap or anything like that. Okay. So now, um, if we want to do the query, and um, like we were talking about before, you break it up into the log and ranges, but like, how do we do that, right? How do we find where these ranges are? So it turns out what you can do is start from the top and then uh, keep iterating down both children until you reach one of two cases, uh, which are the red and the yellow here. So the red case, so in this example, we're querying on the range one to three, okay? And so the red case means that we don't intersect at all with the query range. So in this case, one, three does not intersect at all with four, six, they're completely destroyed. So we know that we don't have to iterate down past that anymore. Um, and then the other case where we stop is where this range is completely contained within the query range. So two, three is completely inside one, three. So we can stop there because we know that we need to take that whole range. The only time that we're iterating down to both the children is when we have a node like say zero six that intersects one three, um, but is not fully contained within one three. Right, so um, same thing here, zero three intersects with one three, but it's not inside one three. So we go down to both the children and you keep doing that until you either hit a range that's completely disjoint or completely within. And it turns out this is only going to visit O of log n um, vertices. OK? All right. Um, so the pseudocode for this would sort of look like this. So if you have, um, if you're at index i, so this is like the index we were talking about before, where like you start out with 1, and then you do 2i and 2i plus 1. This is like your index in the actual array. And then lr stores the range of that index, right? So like, let's say i equals one, then this would be zero comma n minus one because your whole range is at the root. And then ql, qr is your query range. So we have like these two ranges, the node range and the query range. And then you basically just handle the cases we had here. So if there's no intersection, we just return zero. If it lies fully inside, um, we take seg tree i, which is, uh, like the value at the node, so say like seven here, because we, we just add that in. Um, and then otherwise, we can basically split it up into the two children ranges and return the sum of those. Okay. So again, this is just the pseudocode. We're going to get into sort of a nicer way of doing this later on. But any questions on this? OK, so then um, the updates are more straightforward. Uh, basically, what we do there is we start at the root, and we always go toward the child that contains the index we want to update. All right, so again, with this seg tree, we're only updating a single value at a time. Um, so let's say we want to update the value at 4. Um, we just traverse down to the leaf node that contains index 4. And at each of these nodes, let's say we want to increase 4 by like 2 like we want to increment the value by two, then all we have to do is uh, just add two to each of these values. Because these four nodes are the only ones that contain four. So they're the only ones that we have to update if we're changing the value of four. And then the pseudocode for this, it's basically just that. So uh, you increment the value. Um, if it's a leaf node, you can just return. Um, and then otherwise, um, you sort of figure out which half you want to traverse down, and you traverse down that half. 
Okay, um, so any questions on updates? All right, cool. If you guys have any questions, like at any point, uh, feel free to ask because this gets pretty complicated. Okay. All right, so now we're going to get into the implementation that we usually use for segtrees. Um, so if you look at the pseudocode we have here, uh, we're doing it recursively and we're using the um, 2i, 2i plus one trick. Um, but it turns out you can sort of do it iteratively um, and you, it saves you a lot of things. So uh, first of all, it gets rid of the whole four end thing and it makes sure you use only two end memory. Um, and then also you get rid of like any overhead you would need for the recursion. Um, and also the code is significantly shorter. Um, so we're not gonna explain fully why this code works because um, the guy who made it is like absolutely insane. Like he cut it down to like the absolute minimum number of characters. Um, so sort of understanding exactly why every line works is hard, uh, but we're gonna sort of go over like generally uh, how this is similar to what we just talked about here um, and why it works. So you don't really need to understand every detail of this to be able to use it. it it's kind of like what we were talking about with the max flow last lecture. It, you mostly just need to know how to use the template. Okay, and we will have a link to this code at the end of the slides. So for the basic structure, um, we're gonna have this N, which is like the biggest N we can have in any of our queries. Like let's say you know n is less than 10 to the fifth, you can like make n this, right? Um, and then what we're gonna do is we have uh, this type def t. So basically what t is, is um, the type of the elements in your array. So everything so far has been like integer arrays, but you can use a segtree on basically any type. Um, so you could do it on like a pair or, um, anything like that. So we kind of want to have this more general structure so it's easier to adapt the template uh, for any type of a secretary. Um, and then you have some identity element, which is basically um, an element that if you uh, modify some value, if you modify some index with identity, it does nothing. So like in the case we were just talking about, um, like if you're adding, so zero would be the identity because adding zero to something doesn't change it. But like, let's say you're multiplying, you would do one or something like that. Okay, and then T is um, our actual like seg tree array. So that, that's like seg tree in the last example. Um, and we have this function F, which is basically just how do we combine two nodes? So if you have, if your left child has value A, and your right child has value B, what value do you have? So if you're doing the range sum, then you just add them. Um, and this can be any function um, as long as it's associative. Um, so you could do um, addition, multiplication, uh, max, min, anything like that, uh, matrix multiplication, anything like that, um, as long as it's associative. Yeah. One point to mention that's sort of different from the code that Joe had previously is that this code allows for F to be not commutative. So he mentioned matrix multiplication. That's not commutative and, and so the order matters. And I don't think the last code respects that, but this code is made so that it does. As I long think, as it's identity and it's associative, then you're good no, no matter what. I think the last code should respect that. Wait, does it really? That's insane. I, I think so, because you're uh, you're adding the left one before the right one. I no, 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 actually, okay. The update as you go down, you add to directly to the thing, and that is respect if it came from left to right. And so that's not. That's, I don't know yes. That okay. Yeah. So the update doesn't work for community. Yeah. Okay. But yes, yeah, so this one works also for non commutative which is nice. All right. So now we can talk about how to do the modifying the query. And these implementations are like ridiculously short, which is nice. So here's the modify operation. Um, where if you want to set value V at position P. Um, and so, again, I'm not going to get into like too much what this is doing. Basically what this does is um, it sets the value at the leaf to be V. Um, and then it keeps dividing by two. So it keeps going up to its parent. 
And then at each of those parents, it sets it equal to f of its children. Um, so again, f is like, if you're given the values of your two children, that's how you get the parent value. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we're just combining the values of the two children into the parent. Uh, one, the one thing uh, to know about how to use this is you can change this uh, from equals v to whatever function you want to do to change it. So let's say instead of like setting the value to be v, if you want to like increase it by v, you can change this to like a plus equals or something. Um, but yeah, that's the only part of this that you would really change is what you're doing here. So the actual assignment of the leaf. Okay. Questions on this? Yeah, so the one other thing about this is uh, in the other one, we were going from the root down. And this one, um, we sort of go up from the leaves. So it's, it's kind of the reverse, but it's accomplishing the same thing. Uh, you're still only going to look at log n nodes. And that's also true for, oh, yes, I also have the build here. Um, so we don't really use the build um, because but what build does is if you fill the array initially, um, it'll basically do all your setup for you. But you usually don't need to do build because you can just do n modify operations, right? So rather than doing all the setup, you can just call modify n times uh, for each of your initial values, and that will set up your array and n log n. Yeah, so this usually is not needed. And then so the query, um, this is also sort of starting from the leaves and going up. Um, and yeah, so this one, we're really not going to get into. But um, basically, every time uh, you enter into one of these if statements, this is where you've found one of your log n ranges. OK? Um, so every one of these t minus minus r and t l plus plus is one of those log n ranges that you now want to combine into um, your answer. And uh, the reason we have the res l and res r here is to sort of respect commutativity. Um, because if you put it in one um, result, then if you can't uh, iterate through the ranges in order. You need these two res l res r's to sort of keep track of that. But yeah, again, uh, you don't need to know every detail of this. And the, the query function, um, there's not even really anything that you would ever change. So mostly just need to not use it. The one other thing to know is um, it is a half open query. So this is L to R where R is excluded. OK. So then here's the full template. So this is just uh, everything we had so far. Um, it's really short, which is nice. Uh, easy to copy paste in and use however you need to use it. Questions on this template? Cool. All right, so now we're going to talk about range updates. So, so far, all we've talked about is um, uh, when you want to update on a point and query on a range, right? So you, uh, you change one single value or you get the range sum. But in some cases, uh, we want to update a range and look at a point, right? So instead, we could say, like, add five to everything in this range, um, and then you want to get AI, right? And again, we want log in complexity for both of these. And we can uh, achieve this with some slight modifications to the original template. And sort of the way it works is we're going to reverse the modify and the query template uh, uh, functions. So if you look at the modify, this is extremely similar to what our query looked like before. Um, and if you look at the queries, this looks very similar to what our modify looked like. Because uh, again, we're iterating through all the parents back up to the root. And here, again, we're doing the ln1, rn1 thing. Um, so yeah, you can think about this as just sort of switching the role of the modify and the query functions. So again, this case is also uh, pretty easy to handle because 
you just sort of copy these functions in and do that. Um, but where it gets really, first of all, before I move on, any questions on this? Okay, yeah, so where it gets really tricky. Uh, maybe you should when, get intuition on, on why that works just really quickly. Uh, the, the idea for the inverse segment tree is that when you have a range update, we sort of just throw that increment or, or update on that sort of range, right? You decompose this range into sub ranges, right? With for each node, right. we just take all those login nodes and we throw our increment onto it, like our plus five, right? Then we want, we want to query a single value. We go up to the parent and include any of the ranges that were in the middle that had updates in the past at any time. Yeah. So that's how that works. And that's why it's the opposite, because now the modify has a decomposition thing, and the query has the root to parent now instead. Right. So where this gets really tricky is when you have to do range updates and range queries in login. Um, and so the way to do this is called lazy propagation. So the idea is we're going to temporarily store updates at some nodes um, in a separate array and only push the updates to the children when we have to. Um, so sort of what this, yeah, so like a sample problem for this would be um, if you have to do two types of queries, one is increment all your elements by K, um, and the other is print the maximum in LR. Uh, so we can visualize the lazy propagation sort of like this. So let's say we want to increment uh, zero, and five, 0 to 5 by 3. So we do the trick where you break it up into your login ranges. And then every time we hit one of these endpoints, um, we're going to add this lazy value at this node. So we have a lazy array um, for all of these nodes. But here, I just have these marked because everywhere else is 0. right? So this, this has lazy 0, this has lazy 0, this has lazy 0. But at these two nodes, uh, we're going to add a lazy value of 3. Okay. Um, and we're also going to update these nodes with the three. And then, again, propagate that back up. So after doing this update, uh, everything in this part of the tree is fine. The problem is that um, we haven't sent these lazy updates down into the subtrees of these yellow vertices yet. right? Because if we did that, that would be a linear time for every query. Um, so what we do instead is we store it here. And then the next time we hit this node, um, we basically set this lazy back equal to 0, and we send the lazy 3 down to these two nodes and update them. So does anyone have questions on this? This is probably the most confusing part of this presentation. Basically, the idea is we can sort of wait to send this lazy update down um, until we actually need it. So does this make sense? And then, um, the implementation for this would look like this. So uh, basically, every time you do a modify, every time you visit a node, basically, um, if the pending value, uh, which is lazy here, if the pending value is not 0, um, if L does not equal R, which means this is not a leaf node, then we're going to apply this value uh, to its children and then set it equal to 0. And what all apply does is it increments uh, append and seg tree by that amount, or whatever function you have, right? Because in this case, uh, the function is addition, but you could have again any other um, like commutative associative operation here. Um, and then when you get down here, um, it's going to be very similar to our normal like breaking it up into ranges thing. The one other thing is if you hit one that's completely inside QLQR, uh, you apply um, QV, which is the value that you're incrementing it by, to node i. OK. 
Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Right. And then uh, to do a query, it's very similar to non-lazy prop queries, but you just need to, at every node you visit, uh, check if pending i needs to be applied. And if it does, you just call that apply function again. Uh, and overall, it's also going to look very similar to this. OK. All right, so before we get into the sample problems, anyone have um, any other any questions on any of the implementation or anything like that? OK. All right, so for the sample problems, um, we can basically just use the seg trees and like the lazy prop seg tree and all that as like a black box. So we don't have to worry about implementation at all really here. Just assume you have like the um, seg tree and the lazy prop and all that. OK. So the first problem um, is longest increasing subsequence. So you're given an array of n integers, and you need to return the length of its longest increasing subsequence in n log n. Um, and note that the values in the array are also less than 10 to the fifth, um, and n is less than 10 to the fifth. So um, th this becomes important. If these values were not less than 10 to the fifth, there's a way to get around that, but this just makes it simpler. Um, there is also a non seg tree solution to this, but we're not going to get into that right now. So, for an example, like if you have this array, um, the longest increasing subsequence would be one, two, five, seven, eight, which has a length five. So, we would just print five. So, I'll give you guys a minute to think about how to do that. So again, the fact that these are less than 10 to the fifth is important. As a hint, uh, try to think maybe what the n squared DPU solution or something like that would look like. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, I'll give you the hint. It's a linear DP, and each step of the DP also takes linear time. So maybe if you come up with that and extending the seg tree, it might be easier. Yeah, that makes sense. So anyone have any ideas even for like the n squared dp? Wait, the the n squared dp would be the one where each dp state is the longest increasing subsequence that ends 
at that index, right? Yeah. And then for every index, uh, you just look at all the previous indices um, where the values are less than that index and you take the max. Plus one, right? Because you've, you're adding one to the end of it. Um, so now the question is, how do we sort of take that operation uh, and do it quickly with the seg tree? Wait, does everyone understand that first of all? Yeah, then that's a good point. Draw that or something. Or... Um, you could just start yeah, the do... red example, all right? Oh, well, that's smart, yeah. Yeah, OK. One sec. Okay, so the idea is, um, like, let's say you have uh, one, three, two, five, four, three, or something. Um, so for each index, uh, starting at one, starting at zero, uh, we look at all the previous indices that have values less than your current value. And we're going to take the max of those and add one. So in the first one, there are no previous indices, right? So uh, we, the max would be zero. So adding one, we get a DP value of one here. Okay, so for three, now we're looking at all the previous indices that have values less than three, taking the max of those and adding one, right? Because we can take, uh, for example, any subsequence that ends here, and we can extend that by one by putting the three at the end. So here, um, the only index less than three, uh, where the value is also less than three, is one. So we take this one, we add one, we have two, right? Because this one three is an increasing subsequence. Um, so now at the two, um, we're looking at these previous indices, but the only one that has a value less than two is the one, because we can't extend the one, three, we can't add a two here because now that's not increasing anymore. But we can extend the one um, at the two here. So we, this is also two because we can do one, two, an increasing subsequence. And then if we keep iterating, so all of these are less than five. So we can do uh, two plus one equals three here, right? Because we can do either one, two, five or one, three, five. Uh, a similar thing with the four, we can have one, three, four, or one, two, four. So that's also three. Um, and then at this last three, the only ones less than three are the two and the one. And the one with the biggest value is this two. So this is also three because we have this one, two, three. So any questions on this example? This makes sense. So now the idea is we want to do uh, these operations for each index in log n time, right? Because right now we're doing it in linear time because we're checking every other index. But we want to use a seg tree to somehow do this in log n. So the next sort of thing to think about here is uh, if this makes sense, right, that you just get all these DD values and then the last one is your answer, uh, or the maximum of all of them is your answer, then uh, what can we do to make these DP calls uh, or evaluations not linear time? Like how do we how do we basically take advantage of this actually here? What what should we store in there and what should we we, we querying in order to get the DP value out?
so when Joe did his explanation, right, there was really only one thing that was a query in any sense. Because figure out what that is. I think it's going to be really helpful. Anyone have any thoughts at all that I'd like to share? Like, it's okay if you don't have a full solution, but if you have yeah. something that's close or just any thought. Or, yeah, just any thoughts. So, like, the idea is, I guess, you want to query um, the amount of elements within the range to the left that is smaller but and i mean like it's kind of like a dp where like you want to query like the how the maximum you can get from from the range to the left of the element you're looking at i just don't know how you do that but like yeah so when you say left right what you mean is not uh necessarily elements that came before you, but actually elements that are smaller than you, right? And came before you. Yeah, yeah. and came before you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, by left, by, by left, I mean came before you, but you also have to uh, only consider elements that are smaller, yeah. So there's, there's kind, of, kind of two things that you need to keep track of, right? So you can only ask about elements that came before you and were also smaller than you. Yeah. So just another hand, I guess I'm sort of close to the answer, but but is that sec trees let you sort of do two things, right? They let you query not only by they don't only only query by actual ranges in the array itself, but because they have updates, they let you query at different times in your code also. So that that's a kind of hint for how you would do that. I guess maybe we should just show the solution. Because I feel like this is very non-intuitive. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Yeah. Actually, like okay. I, I didn't know how to do this for a long time. I only just figured out now. <laughs> so. so okay, uh, we're going to do an example uh, after this. But basically, what you do is you maintain LIS of i, um, which is the current best LIS you have that ends at value i. So not index i. This is ending at value i. Um, and the operation is we're taking maximums. Uh, so we're going to initialize all of them to zero and then iterate through all the elements in order. And for each value in the array, we're going to set LIS of i to the max of all the smaller ones uh, by value plus one. So note that we're not like explicitly filtering for smaller indices, but we are still getting that because we haven't inserted anything with a bigger index yet. So that's how you take care of the two conditions, right? Yeah. As you Because you're iterating through the list in order, right? Uh, just because you're doing it in order, then you can only ever see things that you've done before already. And when you do the range query, you're doing on ranges that are smaller value. So you're only ever looking at values in your site tree that came before you and came from a number smaller than you in the range. So for an example of this, uh, let's say this was our array, right? right? Uh, so for the first element, one, um, we're going to take a max query from everything up to one, right? So this is everything um, before one in the array, because we haven't inserted anything after one in the array with a value smaller than one. 
and there's nothing here. There's just the zero. So we take this max query and we add one and we put that at value one. Then for the next one, the next one's four. So we're gonna take a max query on this range, um, which again is all the things that are less than four that are also a smaller index than this four because we haven't inserted anything else. Um, and we're gonna take the max here, which is one and add one. So this is two because we can have one four as our subsequence. You should also notice okay. that the arg max that gives you the max uh, is literally the number you would take before if you're actually constructing the LIS. Yes, because you're extending this, that by one. This makes a lot of sense now, but like you're right, it is very non-intuitive. Yeah, like, it's a very hard thing to come up with. Yeah. Um, and so then for the two, we sort of keep going. You take the max query on zero, one, add one, you get two, and then we can keep going like that. So here we do the max query on four again, we get three. Then on seven, we get four. On three, we get three. On six, we get four. And then the last one on four, we get four. And so note that any of these ones that are four, which is our max element, uh, those are the possible endpoints for your longest increasing subsequence. So for the four, we can have one, two, three, four. And then for six, we can have like one, two, four, six, or like one, two, four, seven. So all these ones with the maximums are the endpoints, basically. So then at the end, all you have to do is do a max query on the full array, and that gives you your answer. All right, any questions on this? So this next one is uh, probably harder to figure out than the other one, but it's also very nice. Um, so range less than queries. Um, so we're given an array of n integers, and our queries are. Before that, uh, should we go over how to if if the numbers in this one were bigger than ten to the fifth? Um, oh yeah, we can quickly say that. Yeah. This one. So yeah, you, you can do it. Oh okay, okay sure. Uh, so uh, if you notice in the initial constraints of problem, it talks about that the values had to be less than ten to the fifth, right? Um, and the reason for that is because otherwise you can't fit in the array, right? If you remember, the sec tree was querying on actual values, not indices, right? And so that's why you have to fit. You can't have a sec tree of size 10 to the ninth, for example, right? Um, but what if you don't have that constraint, right? And you, and you were allowed to have really large values. Um, then in that case, you can do something called coordinate compression. Um, and, and what that is, is that if you look at the LIS, the actual values don't matter in the array. O only the relative values matter. It, it doesn't matter that this is four and two, it only matters that four is bigger than two and less than seven, right? And less than six or whatever, right? So for example, if, if this four was, I don't know, 3.5, it wouldn't really matter. It would still be the same thing. Um, and so if you're given really, really large values, let's say like 10 to 9 to 10 to the 18th, then you can instead, you can sort all the values that you're given and then replace them by the indices in, in sort of the, in the sorted order. So uh, for example, one would be one here, two would be two, three, this is a really bad example. Uh, <laughs> But the, but the point is is that uh, you, you can do like you, you can replace each value by its index into all possible values that you have. And since the array is only ten to the fifth big, you only have ten to the fifth actual possible values that you right. utilize out of the ten to the ninth. Right, because the idea is you only have ten to the fifth at most ten to the fifth distinct elements, so you can treat those as like one to ten to the fifth, and it's exactly the same. Okay. So range less than queries. Um, you have your array of n integers, and you want to do queries of the form LRK, where you return the number of elements on the segment L to R that are strictly less than k. Uh, so for example, if this was your array, and you got 0, 2, 4, so on the segment 0, 2, which is 2, 6, 3 here, there's two elements less than 4, so we'd return 2. If we got 2, 3, 3, that's 3, 7 here. Neither of these elements are less than three, so we print zero. Um, so a couple of hints for this, because this is very hard to come up with. Um, so the structure we're going to use to solve this is called a merge sort tree. Um, we don't have to worry about update queries. We're only doing uh, like range queries here. Uh, and the queries can be log squared n rather than log n. And one other hint is um, 
we have the type T of the seg tree, which is like the thing we're actually storing in the nodes. Um, that is not going to be an integer. Actually, I might as well just tell you what that is. So in, in this case, we're going to have T be a vector of integers. So if you guys, I'll give you guys a minute to think about this, but this is again hard. So rather than a seg tree on integers, we now have a seg tree on vectors. Now I know how to solve this problem after like weeks. When, when was that? When did we see that problem, Joe? Oh uh, yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago. It's a CF round, right? Yeah. Add stroke. <laughs> this is, that's actually how I learned how to do this because I like Googled around during the contest and I found someone's code. Nice. Okay, now I see the nice way we can do. Akif is saying, if it's offline, you can sort the queries. Um, you just sort them by K. You sort it by K, and then no. And then just add the elements in the array as you go through. And... Oh. Um, we did this in a code force round like a long time ago. I don't remember. I don't remember. It was in the editorial, nice. Yeah. You're nice. Yeah, I guess that might work. Uh, okay, so assume you have to do it online then. Yeah, that, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, if you're not familiar with offline versus online, offline means you get all the questions asked initially and you can give the answers like kind of whatever you want. Online means you have to answer a question as soon as you get it. Uh, like before you get the next question. Yeah, and the reason this matters is because sometimes if you have all the queries at once, you can kind of find some nice structure on them that allows you to kind of process them in a particular order or one answer builds off another one. Uh, but when you're online, you don't get that freedom. Right. So for example here, if you are given all the queries in just one shot, right, and you can do whatever you want, answer them in any order you want, uh, what you can do is sort the queries by their K value. And as you go through, you process, you add the array elements that are less than K, then answer that query, and then answer, and then add the elements between that query and the next query into your sec tree, and then answer that query, and then so on and so forth as you go. But if you're given the um, queries online, so you're given one query, you have to answer it. Then the next query, you have to answer that query, and like that, then that trick doesn't work because you can't sort the queries in any real sense. So then you need some smarter stuff like Joe was talking about. I think I might just show you guys this because this is very unfair to expect you guys to come up with. You, should, you can give it like a minute or two to think. Okay. I mean, knowing the type does help a little bit. Yeah. Knowing that, like, uh, so so first of all, right, your type is a vector, uh, and then so you should figure out what is a nice way of combining two vectors in a way that makes sense for the you know, seg tree, and then given given an interval that is represented by a vector, uh, what can you do with that? How can you how can you store that in a nice way that you can query uh, how many things are less than k? Oh, so for any non C plus plus people, a vector is an array list, or yeah, it's basically just a list. Yeah, I think I might just show you guys yeah. this. OK. All right, so basically, the idea behind a merge sort tree is it's a segment tree where your type is uh, sorted vectors of ints. So it's a sum sorted like list of integers. Um, each leaf is a vector that contains just AI by itself. Um, and then other nodes contain um, all the elements in both their children. And so basically the way we do that is we have the two sorted vectors for the children. 
Um, and we want to join them together into one sorted vector for the parent. Um, so the way we can do that is we merge them like in merge sort. Um, and C++ actually has a built-in function for this, which is nice. Um, so the total space um, is n log n. So we're not uh, with, we're not using linear space here like for a normal secretary, because imagine how many nodes AI appears in. So AI is going to appear in its leaf node and all of its parents. So it's appearing log n times. And every node is appearing log n times. So space is n log n. Um, and construction time is also going to be n log n, because we have to do all these merges. So basically, here's an example. Um, if this was your original array, uh, you can see, like in the seg tree, the leaves here sort of correspond to the individual elements of the array. So we have the 2, 4, 6, 1, 3, 5, 2. And then uh, at each of these other nodes, we're joining together the two children, um, but keeping it sorted. So 2 and 4 together become 2, 4. When we combine 2, 4 and 1, 6, we combine those together to be 1, 2, 4, 6. And we keep going until when we get to the top, we now have basically a sorted list of everything in the array. OK. Um, so now how to do queries. We're going to break the range up into log n disjoint nodes like we usually do. And then for each node, we can do binary search to find the number of elements less than k, uh, and then take the sum over all these O log n nodes. And again, since it, the binary search takes log n, and we have log n nodes, this is log squared queries. So for example, if we're querying on the range like 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, that would be the union of these two nodes. Um, and let's say we wanted the number of elements less than 4. We just find the number of elements less than 4 here with binary search, so that would be 1 because only one is less than four. And here, um, we, we also have one less than four, because we have three. So we just add those up, and we get two. Questions on how this works? OK. So the implementation is actually really nice for this, because you don't have to significantly change much of the normal seg tree implementation. Um, so the one big change is we can't do modify queries because um, those would take uh, n log n time, I think, to do. Uh, no, that would be linear time. But either way, we can't do that um, because we want all our queries to be like log n time or log squared n time. So instead of doing that, we're bringing back the build function, um, which is basically just doing this uh, standard uh, merge function for C++, um, merging all the parents starting at the lowest ones going up to the root. And then uh, when we want the number of elements less than k in a certain um, node, we, just, we can just use lower bound, which does the binary search um, and gives us an iterator to that first element, basically. So the implementation here is actually very similar to a normal side tree. OK, any questions on this? All right, so we have two more problems, but I think we're just going to end up doing one of them. So OK. So in this problem, uh, you have a string of a's and b's of size n, and we want to do two types of operations in log n. So one is swap all the characters in range l to r, and the other is uh, kind of more complicated. So for all uh, i from l to r, we have these values a and b, right, which are passed into the query. Um, so we iterate from i, I from l to r. Um, if si equals a, we increment a by b. Otherwise, we increment b by a. Um, and we then print a and b at the end of this process, once we hit r. Um, so does anyone have any ideas for how to do this? Another hint for this is this is another one that's going to use uh, kind of a non-standard type for this egg tree. 
This description's like insane. Hold on, I'm still parsing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I have an example on the next one. See, so is that always gonna be yeah kind of large, right? Because you're incrementing A to B and B to A like a lot, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's mod M, right? Uh, or not? Huh? Isn't the don't they ask for mod M also? Yeah, it's probably mod M. Just just assume it's mod M. Okay. Uh, so here's kind of an example because it is a little bit hard to follow. So let's say um, S is A, B, B, and we want to have, we start with A equals one, B equals one, um, and we want to go over the full string. So after the first move, um, we do A plus equals B because we have an A here. So then we get two, one, and then we're going to increment B by A. So now we get two, three, and then we do it again and we get two, five. And so the idea is, um, rather than like a value, we need to kind of store in every node a function that um, like gives you the final A and B values for that node, right? So like the node represents a given range of the array. And we want to like have a function there that tells you if you put this, if you put A and B in here, you get these values out. So. What would this look like? Sorry, can you go back to the previous slide for a second? Yeah. So for now, don't worry about the swap operations. Uh, just think about what's a nice way we can handle these operations. Okay. I probably should have put line breaks in there. So the main question right now is, what type are we going to use for the segment tree? Oh, do you want to use like a pair of how many copies of A and how many copies of B you're going to have? Well, you need to be able to compute this for like arbitrary A and B. But also, copies of A and B are not necessarily enough because it's it's uh, give hint, it's not commutative, right? If you have a, an A and a B versus a B and an A, for example, or A A B versus A B A, right? It's not going to be the same. Okay. So just keeping the counts is not enough. So because I'm doing this for arbitrary A and B, what I want to be able to query out of it is basically some kind of uh, operation that I apply to A and B, and then I get out the actual answer, like what A and B are afterwards. So I have to like keep, pull out the information of what's happening to A and B. Uh, and you compose this in the nice way that you said, right, which is not commutative. Yeah, it's not commutative. But again, we do need associativity.
so one hint is, um, I'm not sure how helpful this will be, but we actually mentioned uh, using this type in a seg tree a bit earlier. As an example, I'm not, I'm not sure how helpful that is. There's only so many options there as a vector. <laughs> or, or like an no. element. Did we use anything else? No, we didn't use it before, but we talked about it. Like, um, yeah, this probably isn't too helpful. So it's not those things. It, it's not, yeah, it's not a vector and it's not just a long. So it's a pair. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're like halfway there. It's a pair of vectors. <laughs> Princeton four. <laughs> matrix. Yeah. A matrix. Yeah. Yep. Oh, God, uh, it's a matrix. Yeah. That so, okay, makes sense. Holy yeah, so What you can do is um, represent it as a two by two matrix. Um, so every A you can represent as this matrix, because if you multiply um, A B times this, you get this. Um, and similarly, we can represent B as this matrix, because if you multiply any AB times this, um, you get this, which is also what you want. And now, um, if we're combining nodes, we just have to multiply the matrices. So like if the string, for the string ABA, that's just the matrix MA times MB times MA. You guys see how that works? Because if we're, Multiplying like this AB here times like this matrix and then this matrix. That's the same as like multiplying this output here by this matrix. So we're sort of using the associativity of matrix multiplication. Um, there it is. That's pretty cool. Right. Now we got to learn the, the new algebra. Okay, fine. <laughs> I don't know how much like vector space dollar you need for this. But... Yeah. yeah. You just go to multiply them and see what's happening. And, yeah. Yeah. I think I just got to the point where I found MA and MB and I just kind of assumed matrix multiplication would work when I saw this. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. But yeah, you don't need to like actually know things for this. I started yeah. doing like, explicit examples of like the matrix multiplication without doing the matrix multiplication and I was like so now uh, for the swap operations, um, all we have to do is swap the opposing elements, the matrices. That's insane. Um, and sort of the justification for this is you're switching the roles of um, A and B, right? Because now um, the ones that used to increment A are now incrementing B and vice versa. Um, so that's kind of a hand wavy justification for why this works. Um, and so these updates are basically just Booleans, right? Because uh, we just need to know, do we have to flip the current matrix? Uh, and we could use lazy propagation to push the Booleans down. I misread the question. I thought you were physically reversing a, sub, a substring. Oh, <laughs> did I like rate that badly? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I probably just don't know how to read. Unfortunate. It's a swap all characters, so I mean. Okay, um, so we have one more, but we're also kind of out of time. Um, I guess we could talk really quickly about this problem because it, it's a nice one. Okay, so this is also a graph problem. Wow. So you're given a tree rooted of vertex one where initially all the vertices are empty. Um, and we have three types of queries where one is you fill vertex V and all its descendants with water one is uh, you empty vertex V and all of its ancestors. So you can think about it as like sort of draining out of V. Um, and then we also need to be able to query whether V contains water at any point. So for example, if we fill uh, three, then this whole subtree would be full. But if we then empty seven, then that empties all of its ancestors. This is definitely yeah. the other thing. Huh? This is definitely, yeah. I was just going to say, I found it kind of humorous that, like, this isn't a max for a problem. I was just like, that was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's in. This so, is not to be, like, DFS, like, the time in, time out. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Okay. Um, so the first thing we have to do is, like, turn this into, 
like an array, right? Because we, we can't do any like nice operations on this tree. I so we want to, huh? Yeah, I know. here you go. Man. Okay, so, so we want to like sort of turn it into an array. And the way we can do that is uh, like Adam said, we do a time in time out DFS. So basically what that is, is you assign every vertex a number based on the order you hit it in DFS. So we would go like zero, one, then back up, two, three, back up, four, five, six, and then seven. Um, and we also store the greatest time in number in every vertices subtree. So four, um, the biggest time in number here is six. So the time out of four is six. It's basically the um, the greatest time out, the, the greatest time in in your subtree. By the way, if you just look at any any node, right, and you look at its subtree, all of their values like on the nodes will be consecutive. If you look at node right. two, it goes three, four, five, six, seven. So it's all one consecutive range for any subtree. Yeah. So okay, the subtree of i is exactly the range uh, time in to time out. So like like Akif was saying, if you look at two, uh, you have two to seven, and the subtree here is two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that that's exactly your range here. So now we have um, every subtree corresponding to um, like a contiguous set of indices. And as for like how to code this, it's relatively simple. Oh 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 no. Oh. Okay. Um, so you can basically just do it in a single DFS like this. Um, yeah, where you pass in the start time and you set time in time out equal to that, and then you repeatedly set time out to be the timeout of your next child. So again, this implementation isn't super important. The idea is we have every vertex corresponding to this segment now. And what this lets you do now is you can do queries, like set, set, set tree queries on any subtree of your tree. Right. So if you want to do a query on like the subtree of two, you just look at indices two to seven, and you do the query there. So that's, that's the point of why we did that. Now, Every vertex is associated with a range that corresponds to its subtree. OK, so now uh, going back to the problem. Yeah, so how would we process these queries? So this is another uh, kind of non-standard segtree type, but it's actually easier than a normal segtree, because we can basically just do a segtree on Booleans here. Because right, all we care about is like the Boolean, is it full of water or not? So how would we uh, do these two types of queries then? Although it is kind of misleading to um, and say the Boolean represents whether it's full or not. It's not going to be exactly that. Actually, yeah, yeah it's. It's not that like at all, but it, it is a sectary on Booleans. So one question is, what is the criteria for a vertex to be full? Everything below it is filled. And yes. So uh, so it can only be full if nothing below it is empty. Um, so the idea here is um, we just store uh, which vertices are empty. And that's what the Boolean does, basically. Um, yeah. 
so a vertex is full uh, if and only if no vertex in its subtree is empty. Um, so yeah, so we set the Boolean equal to true if it's empty and false if it's full, um, with some exceptions, which we'll get to. Um, and so we'll combine the vertices with Boolean or, because um, as long as at least one is empty, then the ancestor is empty. Um, so now uh, for doing our queries, empty queries, we just have to set uh, AV to be true. We're just setting V to be empty. Um, Notice that we don't have to set any of its parents to be empty, because um, if we're, say, querying any range that includes any of its parents, that range also includes v. So it will contain one empty one. So we don't need to uh, sort of push that update. Um, and then for the fill queries, uh, we just set, we do a range update on the subtree and we set them all, that should be false. We set them all equal to false. Um, and then for the print queries, we're just checking if um, all, everything in the subtree is false. Why is that not just a point query? Can we, if, if any of the subtree are true, then won't it also be true? No, because when we do these empty queries, we're not sort of pushing it up to the ancestors. Ah, uh, that's good. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. All right, any... No, 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 no. It won't it get pushed by the action of the secretary itself? Like, won't the secretary combine push it up there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um... Yeah, so then I guess you can just do a point query here to print. Any other questions? OK, uh, so that was all we had for today. Thank you guys for coming. Um, we have a bunch of stuff in the next two slides if you guys want to practice. Um, and the link to these slides is in the info channel on Discord. So we have. Um, the basic template that we went through before. Um, there's also this code forces blog, which is where we got that template. Um, and they also have a relatively short iterative lazy prop template, although that is like very hard to understand. Um, Akif and I have been trying for a while and it's it's hard. Um, but if you want to learn uh, anything about like using this template or anything, this is a very good blog. Um, and then we have some practice problems too. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for coming.